You're listening to Rabbi Arya Wolby, Director of Torch, the Torah Outreach Resource Center of Houston. This is the Jewish Inspiration Podcast. Thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. It's so wonderful to see everyone. I want to thank everyone who's here in person at the Torch Center, and I want to thank all of you who are online here with us. Uh, thank you for all of the comments, all of the questions. Um, as you can tell, I'm not one uh, who really loves emails, <laughs> right? Lauren, you'll forgive me on that one. Uh, I don't really, especially when they're when they're long ones. If it's like more than like three lines, I'll just just call me and tell me what you want. No problem, I'll, I'll answer. But either way, because of today's trait, whoever emails me this week, I will respond <laughs> in a timely fashion. Okay, because of today's trait. So, what is today's trait? Today's trait is zrizut. Zrizut is translated as alacrity or zeal. Some, some translate it as being, uh, quick, fast, speedy, immediate, prompt, swift, agile, uh, speedy, enthusiastic, excited, eager, motivated. All of these are translations, so to speak, of this trait, this word called zrizut. In Hebrew, when someone says zariz, it means someone who does something fast. But the Torah doesn't necessarily want us, God doesn't necessarily want us to do things quickly. Okay, so what does it mean when we say the word zariz or zrizut? It means not to delay. Not to delay. Now, before we begin, you know, we sent out, I hope everyone received this in your inbox, uh, we had, you may get two emails, one that says that class is starting in 80 minutes and one that says it's starting in 70 minutes. Mm-hmm. We're having this problem. I've never had an issue with our system uh, till this class, this series. Last week we had the problem and it came a day late. And tonight we had the issue again. Didn't you didn't get one, right? Mm-hmm. So we have, we have, we started a new system later on tonight. So hopefully everyone received that email. Those who went through the website, who registered through the website, you should have received a link to the folder, which has all of these, uh, all of these sheets, all of the handouts. Uh, but when we're going to work on tonight's tr- trade, which is with the Mito worksheet, which you should hopefully have every night e- at every class, uh, for the end of the class, we'll go through it and we'll work on here we go. So this is the meter worksheet. And the meter worksheet is structured in a way that we will, throughout the class, we will be defining the trait. You'll be defining the trait. And then take your own introspection when you have a few minutes and evaluate. Where are you holding as an individual? Where am I holding in this trait? And then set out a plan of how you want to tackle this trait. But before we do that, it's important for me to share with you Two very, very critically important pieces of information. The first is that Judaism is a one small step system. It's a one small step system. What do I mean by one small step? So do you know that in in the in the tabernacle, in the tabernacle there was a ramp that led to the altar. There were no stairs. There was only a ramp. Why was there a ramp? Our sages tell us an incredible, incredible message. Because a ramp, you know, what happens if you take a ball and you put it on a ramp? It rolls down. Take a ball, you put it on a ramp, it'll roll down to the bottom. But what happens if you take a ball and you put it on a staircase? You put it on a staircase, you can... Set it still. Leave your house, go on vacation, go on your cruise. You come back a week later, 10 days later, and the ball is exactly where you left it. You can stagnate on a staircase. You cannot stagnate on a ramp. And the first message that we learned from the tabernacle is that there's no stagnation in Judaism. It's like a ramp. We have to always be taking a step. But there's a much greater message that we can learn from the ramp. And that is a staircase is pre-engineered. You have an engineer who designs the staircase at about six and a half inches each step 
one from the next one. It's about six and a half inches. And that's the way it is. Now, let me ask you a question. That's discriminatory, very discriminatory. Because if you, my little daughter, when she was taking her first steps, she couldn't pick up her leg that high. And she couldn't get to the second step and to the third step. I had to lift her up. You take a, someone who's elderly and difficult for, it's difficult for them to walk, right? You try to lift, the, lift their legs up. It's, it's a difficult step. But, but that's, it's pre-engineered. In Judaism, we don't believe in pre-engineered growth. Every person needs to take their own size step. That's why the symbol that we see in the temple, in the temple, in the tabernacle was a ramp to tell every Jew, this is the key to your growth. You need to take your own small step. You need one small step for mankind, right? <laughs> one, one small step for men. One huge leap for mankind, right? But the idea is that we need to take a small step because as human beings, if we want to grow, the only way for that growth to be impactful, for that growth to be consistent, it needs to be small steps. I recommend, there's a fantastic book, and I don't get any any um, kickbacks for this, okay? This is a book called Atomic Habits. It's about small steps, and I I think this is a perfect Musser study book. It's not written, I don't know, James Clear is the author. I don't even think he's a Jew, but it's a, it's a Torah value through and through. It's about taking microcosmic, micro steps that are so small and insignificant, that's what makes the change. Small, steady steps. The second message I want to tell you is as follows. My grandfather, uh, during the Yom Kippur War, uh, was asked to fly to Egypt to give words of inspiration to the commanders, to the officers, to the soldiers who were out in the battlefield. And they put him on a military aircraft, and they flew him to Egypt. And during the flight, my grandfather looks out the window, and he sees that the plane is flying so low. And he asked, is there any issues with the engines? Why are we flying so low? So they said, no, 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 no. You have to understand that they still have radars. The Egyptians still have radars that detect aircrafts, aircraft flying. And if they detect an aircraft, they'll shoot us down. Their rockets will will shoot us down. So we're flying below the radar. So my grandfather said, this is a metaphor for life, for Jewish spirituality and growth. And that is the Yetzahara, the evil inclination, is always there like the radar to shoot us down. But he doesn't look to shoot down the little guy. He looks to shoot down who's the big shot. You know, it's like the police officers. They're not looking for the guy who's driving two miles over the speed limit. They're looking for the guy who's driving 30 miles over the speed limit, right? Who's flying high? For example, I'll give you an okay? Anyone ever go to a lecture talking about, let's say, one of these Musser classes, talking about getting things done, not procrastinating, you know, not delaying, and that's it. You leave class and you're like determined. You pull out your worksheets and you're like, okay, that's it. I'm never going to delay. When something comes up, I'm going to, right? And what happens? We crash and burn. God forbid, right? It's it's a disaster because the Yetzahara says, oh, let me see who the big shot is. Let me see who the person who's going to say, oh, I'm never going to talk slander about anybody ever again. Right? I'm always going to remember to, you know, when we take such grand steps, it's an easy target for the Yetzahara to shoot us down. We take small, small, small steps. We stay below the radar. We fly below the radar. We're patient. One small step and another small step and another small step. That is the key to growth. Okay? This is such a fundamental principle in Judaism. We need to take small steps for our growth because then it's oh, said so what's the question i get every time I, I i mention this story i mention the story about the about my grandfather's flight to egypt so everyone asks the same question well okay rabbi so if you take one thing on yourself and then another thing on yourself and another thing on yourself and another thing even though they're very small eventually you'll be above the radar 
That's a great question. So the answer is like this. We don't just take things upon ourselves. They become part of who we are. So if, for example, we try to incorporate a certain habit into our lives, what happens is that now that habit, after time, becomes who we are. It's not like we added something. So what you're doing is is essentially raising up the ground level. Keep on raising up the ground level. Understand? So it's not like, oh, we're going to get above the radar, but rather what you're doing is you're elevating from from the ground up, we're elevating ourselves and everything else around us is elevating itself as well. It's get, it's get, getting raised higher and higher. So this is something which is really, really important for us to understand. That when we work on a trait, don't try to jump too high too quickly. Take a small, something small, something atomic. And that change will be the change that will, will, transform your life forever it's so i'm telling you it's it's i'll give you another example a diet anybody here ever try a diet i did many times right and we try to say oh okay no more this no more that we try to you know it's like and how many times does that work very rarely but if we take one small adjustment one small thing i'm going to take one beverage out of my diet. I'm going to take one food out of my diet. Something small that can make the difference over the long term. We, you know, it's like they say if you take an airplane leaving uh JFK Airport that's heading to Los Angeles and all you do is change it 3 degrees. 3. You know what 3 degrees is? It's like from here to like that. It's like you can hardly it's it it's almost not recognizable the difference. You know where you'll end up? You'll end up in Mexico. Just three degrees. That's it. Over time, it's a huge impact when we're able to change one small little step. So I just want to give that as a disclaimer. We're going to start. We're going to talk about this trait of springing into action, not procrastinating, getting things done, which is a very fundamental introductory trait in Musar study. You have to remember, don't take too big of a leap because that could that could really bring us to despair where we say like, I tried, I was inspired, I, got, I, got, I wanted to get things done and then everything fell apart. Okay? So we are all forewarned. We're all, okay, we got this, right? Small steps, small steps, small steps. And just don't beat yourself up in a week and say, I can't believe it. Nothing changed. That's normal. Okay, it's small microscopic changes that really transform who we are. Nobody wrote a book in a day. You write a line and then you add another line and then you add another line. Before you know it, you have a book, right? But it takes time. It ta- it's, a, it's a very, we're all creatures of habit. We're all creatures of habit. But we take habits many times that are comfortable for us. But when we need to make a change, it's not so comfortable. It's not the way. But but we have to figure out small ways. And there's a lot of great secrets to it, which we will be sharing, hopefully, throughout this, this whole series. Okay. So, Zrizut, we were talking about the trait of alacrity. Okay. And this is the first one on the sheet. I decided that we're going to do the positive traits in the, in the 10 weeks that we're together in this seminar. Hopefully, we'll be able to tackle 10 of the, or maybe nine remaining weeks, we'll, we'll deal with the first nine of the positive traits on the Who Am I sheet, and we'll go in order, all right? So we'll start, the first one is alacrity, and hopefully next week we'll do appreciation, and then we'll do caring, and so on and so forth. Okay. So, if we want to give a pre-class summary, what are we going to say throughout this class Essentially, what we're going to be saying is that we need to not let opportunities pass us by. Life presents itself constantly with opportunities. Zrizut means jump on the, on the train because those, that train is moving. Life is moving. We're always moving. We're on a train. And if we don't jump on that train, 
Life will pass us by. Make the most of every moment. Make the most of every moment. I'll give you an example. And this will, will interpret, we'll be able to interpret in many different ways. But does everybody enjoy coffee in the morning? Right? Do we enjoy coffee? We love coffee. Right? I love coffee. Without two cups of coffee, my day hasn't begun. Okay? So, I learned something really special in this, in my own study of Musar. I learned something very, very special. There are two different ways you can drink coffee. You can drink coffee where you have your coffee mug and you got your bag and your notes and your papers and you run out of the house and you're, you're running into your car and your radio is on and it's all busy and you, you finally get to work and you're like, oh, like, I got to get the day going. I get right. Or you take your coffee and you take a smell. Ah, I'm the luckiest human being on earth. I have coffee. It's warm coffee. It's delicious coffee. It smell that smell. Ah. Right? What's the difference? The difference is, is that one, one way you're rushing through life. In one way, you're taking every experience you have, hopefully, starting with the coffee, and enjoying it and maximizing it. Don't rush through it. When you're living through life, live through life. Don't exist through life. So when you grab that coffee tomorrow morning, that could be your that could be your acceptance for Zrizut. Take a second and just enjoy the moment. We're in, in a rapid fire paced world where everything's on a, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. It's like it's like scrolling on, on Facebook or, or Instagram, or it's like just everything's scrolling. Move it, move it, move it. It's okay. Take it easy. Just enjoy. Okay, so make the most of every moment. That's part of Zrizut. It's part of alacrity and zeal. Is we think it's to move fast. No, 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 no. Make it count. Don't be lazy and don't procrastinate. Don't be lazy and don't procrastinate. Okay, we'll see what this means and let's get into it. Okay, so really zeal or or uh, alacrity is the introduction to all traits because if a person is stuck with laziness, then they can't work on anything. So we'll never be able to work on any trait if we don't have this one mastered somewhat, at least getting into, you know, right now we're going to touch a flavor of it. I've dedicated uh, in in different locations, of uh, we've taught this class as a four or five week series. Just this trait, just this trait, because there's so much to talk about to really uh, internalize and make this something which is. And and by the way, just because I spoke about it in other classes doesn't mean that I don't waste time and I don't procrastinate and I'm not lazy, right? I guarantee you, it's something that we constantly need to remind ourselves of. We uh, uh, of we need to. Co- constantly renew and refresh ourselves with this okay it adds quality to our actions so you're while you have that same coffee it's a different coffee now you're adding quality to the experience you're you're doing your paperwork right you can stop for a second and realize how fortunate you are that you have a job that you're able to sign documents you put things into perspective it's also the battle against our nature. Our nature, the Ramchal, the great Kabbalist and Musar master, the Ramchal, who lived 200 years ago, in his first chapter discussing Musar matters, he says, the nature of man is heavy. We are all heavy human beings. Look at this pen. This is not a heavy pen. But you know what happens if I leave go of this pen? It falls. It falls. Why? Because nature, everything in this world is heavy. Every human being prefers sitting and relaxing than going and working. Of course, we want to accomplish. Of course, we're motivated. We have uh, we have objectives and we have goals and we have missions and we have you know we have, we have passions. But the nature of mankind is heavy. We don't want to rush and work. We don't want to, you know, run around and do things. You know, I know many people who prefer just sitting and watching football. And I want to, 
right? Congratulate you, Ed, right? You had your Alabama game tonight, and you came here to learn Torah. You drove 70 miles to get here. It's really incredible. So congratulations. But that's, you know, we all have these choices that we need to make. And the truth is, is it we have to battle against our nature. The nature of humanity is to be sedentary, is to be heavy. And the minute we recognize this, it makes life a lot easier. The minute we realize, you know what? You know, trying to get out of bed in the morning is like, oh, it's such a drag. It's so, I'm so tired. I, I don't want to do this. I'll, I'll hit the snooze button. But when we realize, you know what? That's my nature. My nature is to be heavy. Let me fight my nature. Let me push myself out of my comfort zone. It's not about time management. I just want you to realize that it's not about, we're not, we're not doing a, a class, although, I have, uh, in previous years, taken the opportunity when I was discussing this topic to really work on a very strict, you know, I'm what we call punctually challenged, okay? <laughs> so, um, so I, I, to me, it's, it's a very important thing, and I've been working for many, many years. You've been in my classes for 12 years, right? About 12 years? And you've seen that, you know, I, I've been working on this. I'm not perfect yet. Right, but I've been working on on becoming more timely and more punctual and being where I need to be on time or early. It's to me, it's a total shift in everything in my life because I'm a, I love last minute. I love you know getting it done in crunch time. It's like that's my that's my sweet spot. My wife goes crazy about that. She's like she she like if it's like an hour before you know before some, before any deadline. Like that's, 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 I live there. Okay. I live there. Right. And my wife, my wife is like, she can't, she can't stand that. I, you know, the, like that's, that's when I kick it into high gear. It's just like, we had two weeks to deal with this. Now you have to do it. Right. It's like now. Right. Well, we but, you right. Thank you. Thank you. So, <laughs> so the, yeah. Well, <laughs> over here, uh, the, the people in person class know that it's called Walby time. And, but, uh, we try, we try to, um, it's life is about working on ourselves. It's a workshop. We say this about marriage. It's a work workshop in character development, but life is a workshop in perfecting our character. That's really what it is. Nobody is perfect. We just, we talked about that last week. Everyone has to find where their weak link is and try to fix it. By the way, even in our positive traits, we have some traits that we'll be much stronger at and some traits that we're a little bit weaker and we need to pay attention to it. It's just like, you know, you ever, anyone ever take their car, you take your car in for a tune-up and they say, you know, you got to fix, your oil needs to be changed or your your ear filter needs to be, or your tire is is missing some pressure, right? It, the, you, you need to tune it up. As human beings, Musser is our tune-up. We have to tune up all of the, because it's not going to fix itself. Your car is not going to fix itself. You got to take it to the dealership or take it to where your mechanic, right? And get it tuned, tuned up. This is our own spiritual tune up where we check, you know, check the air pressure and check the, check the tires and check the, uh, the filters and check the, the, all of the fluids. This is what we need to do. And this is, this is, uh, our work. So it's not, it's not about time management. Or to do things quickly, rather setting our priorities and becoming doers. This trait is about becoming doers. Our, our sages actually, I had I wrote down here, our sages say that um, you know it's actually there's a very good a very good uh, marketing uh, slogan by Nike. It's called "Just Do It," "Just Do It." It's such a motivating three words. Just do it, right? Get, become a doer. But our sages, I had it over here. Oh, listen to this. Amazing. It says, Cain minog bnei adam. This is the custom among people that when they see a zealous person, meaning they see someone who gets things done, they say, this is someone who is all life. He's living. He's, he's doing things. 
He's getting things done. When they see someone who is zaris, meaning he doesn't let opportunities pass him by. That's the type of people we want to become. People, when, when people look at us like, you know they say, if you want something done, if you need help getting something done, ask a busy person. The busy people yeah. get things done. Yeah. Right? What does that mean? That means that there are people who always, there are people who you'll ask them, like they never get anything done. I want to share with you an amazing story. <laughs> an amazing story. There was a, um, there was an innkeeper. There was an innkeeper who was a very righteous Jew. He was a righteous Jew. But he didn't own his inn. He rented it from one of the governors. The governor was the landowner, and he rented it from him, and he sublet it to the people who came to his inn. So one day, um, he realized that the governor is going to rent this property, take it away from the Jew, and give it to someone else that he was closer with, he had a better relationship with. See, he met a wealthy Jew, and he says this to this wealthy Jew, he says, I know that you do a tremendous amount of charity, you do a tremendous amount of business, and that you know this governor, you know him very well. Can you speak to the governor on my behalf and persuade him to give me the new lo- the new lease on this property that he shouldn't give it away to someone else so this wealthy jew says i'll talk to him no problem i'll do that i'll do you that favor but i have to travel this week i'll talk to him when i get back i have to travel there was a big show that they used to have in germany in leipzig there was a big show a big, uh, you know, they would have a big market and people from all over would come. He says, I can't, my business is shut if I don't go there. I need to go there first. I'm going to be there for a week. And when I get back, I will take care of, I'll speak to the to the governor. So he goes, he travels to this to this expo. And meanwhile, this poor Jewish guy comes home and he tells his wife, I spoke to the wealthy man. And the wealthy man is uh, said he's first going to the expo in, in Leipzig. And then when he comes back, he'll speak then. He's they're so worried. He, he, you know, we, we're going to lose the opportunity. We're going to lose the opportunity. What's going to happen? And the wife starts stressing out. And she's she's becoming very anxious. And she starts yelling at her husband. I told you this is what's going to happen. And she's like they started getting into this whole fight, into this whole thing. Finally, a week later, this wealthy man, as he promised goes to speak to the governor, and the governor says, no problem, I'll let this Jewish guy continue the lease, and I'm not going to I'm not gonna kick him out. Okay. A little while later, this wealthy man passed away. And one night, this innkeeper, this Jewish man, who the wealthy man did this favor for, has a dream. And in this dream, this wealthy man tells him, I came up to heaven and they judged me that I was a good man and I deserved to go to heaven. And they escorted me to the gates of heaven and they said, you were a good man, but you made that poor Jew, the innkeeper, wait a week. You made him wait a week. Do you know how much pain that caused him? Do you know what a fight that caused between him and his wife? And for that reason, we can't let you in to the Garden of Eden, so to speak, into heaven. For the same seven days that you made him wait. See, he asked in a dream, he says, please, innkeeper, forgive me. He says, here I'm standing at the gates of heaven and I can't go in. Please forgive me so that I can I can be allowed in. I thought this was an astonishing, an amazing story of the importance of not delaying things because sometimes, particularly when other people are depending on our actions, it's important to do things quickly and to not procrastinate because what happens when we procrastinate, we say, listen, my time is my time. And, I, and that's understandable. You know, I sometimes, you know, I'm approached by people in the community and I need to handle matters in the community. I got a phone call last night uh, from a woman in our community 
who was concerned about a specific issue in the neighborhood. And I told her, as soon as I hang up the phone, I will draft an email to the local community rabbis. I understand this was an important matter. It's something that she's going to lose sleep over. So as soon as I sent that email, I texted her and let her know. I sent the email, and hopefully within a short period of time, it was already 11.30 at night, but it was when she called, it was 11.30, so it was probably 12 o'clock by the time I sent the email, it will be handled. She needed to, because I don't want her going to sleep thinking, did he send it? Did he not send it? Did he take care of it? Is it important enough, right? It's an important thing. It's right. We, we, and this is obviously in preparation for this class because I'm, I'm thinking I, I got to get things done, right? It's important to remember that as human beings, we'll all make mistakes. We'll all have things that will fall through the cracks. That's true. But when we're thinking about springing into action, when something comes up, to do it. Now, that doesn't mean to be, oh, I got to get it done and, and start having chaos and like, take it easy, take it easy, right? Get things done, be focused, don't don't procrastinate, don't push things, I'll get it done later, I'll get it done later, I'll get it done later, because then there's a big danger with getting, with doing things later. You know, it's very interesting. We have many laws in the Torah that it says about those mitzvahs, Zrizin Magdimin Lemitzos. Those who are fast, those who don't procrastinate, the mitzvahs come to them. The mitzvahs are their are their life. I'll give you an example. Do you know that uh, lighting the menorah on Hanukkah? We all love lighting the Hanukkah menorah. There's a specific time that you're supposed to light as the stars come out. Right? Sunset, stars come out, and then we, we light the we light the menorah. It's a specific time when we're supposed to light. It says don't delay. In what way does it say don't delay? It says don't start eating a half hour before lighting the menorah. You know why? Because you start eating, you get carried away, and then after you're eating, you're like, oh, I need to take a little nap, right? <laughs> oh, I'm so tired, right? And then it, it gets pushed off. And you could forget to light the menorah. Another example. We build the sukkah. We build a hut. The halacha tells us, when do we do that? We do that immediately after the fast of Yom Kippur. You break the fast, go outside and build your sukkah. You know why? Because you could delay it and you delay it one day and another day. By the time Sukkot comes, only four days later, I forgot to build my sukkah. These... So why do our sages tell this to us? Because that's the nature of mankind. The nature of mankind is that we get carried away with things. It's not that we're bad people. It's not that we're lazy people. Maybe we are a little bit, maybe, right? But the idea is that we're busy with things. We get busy. We get busy eating. We get busy drinking. We get busy with our job and with things, right? And that is – it can can cause – a a a problem in life if we don't number one prioritize but also make make um, make things that are important uh, and put them put them in front. So doing a mitzvah and not procrastinating, not wait, not not letting it uh, expire. It says is a maaseh is an action shahashchina shora. Aleha. The presence of God, when we jump at a mitzvah, we jump at an opportunity. Someone calls you for a favor. You can say, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. Or you can say, I don't know. Let me think about it. I'll get back to you. I'll see. Right? That's Those are all, um, we can say excuses. I don't want to say excuses. I want to be nicer. Right? Those are things that sometimes are a tactic to push it off, to procrastinate, to maybe, 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 and then perhaps we never get to it. I've shared this story before, and we, we have to realize this, is that when, 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 when a mitzvah comes to your door, when a mitzvah comes to your door, I'll, I'll share with you an incredible... Um, here we go. 
I love teaching from the Torch Center because we have such a massive library behind us. And I want to share with you uh, a beautiful introduction here to one of the one of the, the portions here. It says an amazing thing. So the introduction is by Rabbeinu Bachia. He says, you have to understand something, okay? When a poor person comes to your doorstep and asks you for charity, listen carefully. It says, give charity to every poor person who asks you. He says, why? Because there's a verse. There's a verse. It says, no sin la rush ain't marsu. You give to a poor person, you will never miss out. Why? Listen, it's the most amazing thing. I'm going to read this to you inside so you don't think I'm making this up. He says, because when someone asks you for charity, do you know who that person is? That person is not really a person. Kianosin stakala ani, when the person gives charity to the poor, lahakadosh baruchu nosna, you're giving it to the Almighty. What does that mean? You're giving it to the Almighty. Someone comes to you, someone knocks on your door, says, hey, who's that? Jared. What's going on, Jared? Right? He says, Jared, can you help me out? I have this institution. It's really important. Great, great. does great things. Right? You say, well, I don't know. You know, I'm a, I just gave money to, to my local synagogue and I gave money to the federation. I gave money to the, you know, to my child's uh, daycare program. And it's like, you know, I'm, I'm a little strapped. Never send someone away empty handed. Give them something. Why? You think it's just the person who came to you. Wrong. It's the Almighty who came. It's the Almighty who came to test you. He wants to see, are you going to greet them with a smile? Are you going to, are you concerned for what their, what their issues are? They say more than what a poor person needs in the money that you give him. It's the smile, the teeth, the white teeth that you show him. It's the quality of the mitzvah, not the quantity. To do a quality mitzvah. So when we have an opportunity that comes away, an opportunity knocks on our door, it's the Almighty there saying, Hey, I want to see, are you serious about this? Do you really want this opportunity that I'm bringing your way. Give you an example. You get a phone call. Oh, there's someone who missed their flight. Can you go pick them up from the airport? <laughs> I have a thousand things to do today. Picking someone up from the airport is not one of them, right? Because generally the way our day goes, it's like this is what I have on my schedule, right? And there's no room for anybody else's things on my schedule, Right? It's not, it's not, this is not, when I looked at my schedule this morning or last night, it wasn't on my schedule. And we sometimes are a little bit, we, we don't want to be as flexible, perhaps, for what might be important to someone else. But I'll, I want to share with you an amazing story. I got a call. It was probably, it was also, I, all these calls come at night, but I get a call, uh, uh someone from, from our community, uh, was coming from St. Louis. And his flight was delayed, and he tells me, Rabbi, you know, I'm so sorry to call you, but I, I don't know who to call, and my flight is arriving at one o'clock in the morning, um, and, and I know you're probably the only one in our community who's up at that hour, so can you can you pick me up from the airport at one o'clock in the morning? I said, sure, no problem. Just send me the flight information, no problem. Now, I I mean, again, this is. I'm trying to live what I what I teach, right? What we learn from our sages, what the Torah teaches us, right? I didn't think too practically about this. But a few minutes later, I texted him. I said, hey, 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 you didn't send me your flight information. Can you please send me your flight information? Because, I, you know, so he texts me back. He says, never mind. He says, I got to the gate and I saw someone else there that I knew and he has a car at the airport. He's going to give me a ride back. So I ask you, my friends, why did God make him call me? 
at 10 o'clock at night, at 9.30 at night, whatever time it was. And then well, you think God didn't know that there was someone at the gate that he was going to see five minutes later? So why did God ask? Why did God make him ask? It's my test. It's exactly it. It's my test. And, and I'm telling you, we all have these tests every single day. To see, are we willing to do something for someone else? Are we willing to step out of our comfort zone? Are we willing to adjust things that is like, this is not what I had in mind? I saw someone yesterday. Um, I get a phone call. This is right before the wedding we had here, the beautiful wedding at the Tour Center. Um, I'm about to officiate a wedding for a lovely bride and groom who are sitting here, Mazel Tov. And uh, we have a bride right here who's getting married tomorrow, God willing. Right. <laughs> so uh, so as I'm on the way coming to the Torch Center, I get a phone call from a friend of mine. He says, hey, my son was just driving past the Torch Center and his car broke down. He got a flat tire. Can you help him fix it? As those of you who know, we have an organization called Chavirim, where we help people for all non, for, we have a Hatsala for medical needs and Chavirim for non-medical needs and, uh, volunteers. I dispatched it and two guys were there in no time. But I stopped by on the way before I walked in here to the torch center. I stopped by and said, guys, is everything okay? And I could see the distress of the guy who got the flat. I can see the distress in his face. This was not on a schedule. Okay, this was not on his schedule. He said, so I said, I walked over to him. I said, hey, let me give you a hug. Let me give you a hug. I said, it's going to be okay. Don't worry about it. He says, and he says, so frustrated. He's so frustrated. He says, I was supposed to be hitting tennis balls right now. <laughs> it was like, right? This was not on my schedule. Okay. And, it, you know, it took 10 minutes and he was back on the road. But Hashem sometimes does that to us. Probably every day. It's more than we know. Right? Where things don't go our way. You had an appointment and you come to the office and they say, sorry, I don't see your name on the – right now. It probably happened to everyone. Everyone's nodding their head. Yeah, I had that. Right? You go to DMV and you had an appointment and it says, sorry, it's not in our system. Go reschedule. And what do you mean? It's okay. Right? But – well, I don't want to get too much off topic. But we see there's an amazing mitzvah. That's supposed to be done very, very fast. Anybody know what mitzvah that is? Very, very fast. In fact, it's supposed to take only 18 minutes. Making the, matzah. the matzah, very good. The matzah, from the beginning, from the first drop of water touching that flower till the matzah leaving that oven is 18 minutes or less. If it's 18 minutes and one second, it's over. You lost the opportunity. It's chametz. It becomes leavened food. Our sages tell us something. The word matzah and the word mitzvah are identical. And our sages tell us, mitzvahs you can't delay. When a mitzvah, when you have an opportunity for a mitzvah, don't delay. Don't let it become chametz. It's such an, an amazing lesson for us. So, yeah, anyone, you know, it's an amazing thing. You, you ever hear a lecture, you hear, uh, you know, one of these inspirational, motivational speakers, and you're like, wow, that's it. I'm, I'm changing the way, I'm changing the way I wake up in the morning. I'm changing the way I live my life. I'm changing the way I eat. I'm changing, every, I'm changing, right? Why? Why would these inspirational speakers still be in business and people go back again and again and again and again and people don't change? You know why? It's one three-letter word that doesn't happen after the inspiration and that's act. A-C-T. People don't act. When something inspires you, act on it. Put it into action. You have an inspirational thought. Don't just stay inspired. Write it down. Do something about it. Make that phone call. Oh, I'll get it done next week. I'll get it done tomorrow. You know what they say? Today is the tomorrow you said yesterday. 
Every day we say, oh, tomorrow. Well, today is that tomorrow that you said yesterday. It's such a it's such an important thing. You know, there are different ways that people do acts of kindness. There are people who you give them the opportunity, they're on it, and people are like, oh, whatever. Procrastinate. There are different ways that people go to a synagogue. There are people in my neighborhood, we're we're a pretty, pretty, you know. A closed-in neighborhood. Some people call it the ghetto, right? So, like, right? So, people are walking to shul. People are driving to shul. There are people who are taking their time going to shul, to synagogue, right? It's different ways. They're both going to the same place, but there are people who have. They're on a mission. And people are like, my wife told me I have to, so I'll go. You know, right? So it's like. And, and, and the truth is, what type, we have to determine for ourselves what, in every area of life, what type of person am I going to be? Am I going to be the person who's, I got to get things done? You know, the clock is ticking. I, you know, I have, I know this is a little bit of a morbid thought, but think, hold, stick with me for a second here. I think the greatest gift to give to any child born is a, is a counting, uh, a counting down clock. From 120 years, 120 years, as soon as the baby's born, start the clock, 119 years, 11 months, right? 29 days, 23 hours, 59 minutes, okay? And slowly, it, every second goes down, it goes down. Imagine if we had such a clock. And then you wake up in the morning when you're 20 years old and you see, uh-oh, I only have 100 years left. And when you're 40 years old, you say, oh, I only have 80 years left in the best case, right? I think it would put a different a different value to life that we realize that we don't have eternity. We have a limited time. And we need to maximize. What? <laughs> you're saying that you wake up at 90, you have 30 years left. Yeah, I hear it. I hear it. So... The, the, but, but it, it's such a, it's such a perspective that we realize one second, you know, we don't have forever. It's a limited amount of time and we can, we can fill those years, those minutes, those hours, those seconds with quality seconds and quality minutes and quality hours without regrets. I can't begin to tell you how many people I've met in their 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. And you tell me, Oh, Rabbi, if I just would have met you 40 years ago. My life would have been different. Well, you didn't meet me 40 years ago. Today, today is a day. Now, I'm not the Messiah. You know what I'm saying? It's like, but today is today. Today, make today count. Make today an amazing day where nothing, nothing passes by you. No opportunity passes by you. That's what Zrizut is. Zrizut means I don't let it expire. An opportunity comes my way, let's get it done. Let's get it done. And we all have the ability to prioritize what's important, what's not important, what's more important, what's less important. There are, you, know, you know, there's an, an amazing principle by one of the great, uh, um, one of the great, I don't remember the book, but it, uh, I actually remember the name of the book. It's called Getting Things Done. When I came, when I moved to Houston and I became the executive director at Torch, now, almost 17 years ago. So a friend of mine gave me a, a book. I don't remember the author, but it's called Getting Things Done. And he has the 4D policy. Okay, everything. You have a desk filled with papers. You make four piles. Each one is a D. Okay, do, defer, delay, and delete. Oh, I have it here. It's David Allen. David Allen, Getting Things Done. Okay, do, Defer, delay, and delete. Right? The same thing with your inbox, your your mail. How many how many how many emails do we have? And we say, ah, oh, someday. I told you, anybody who emails me this week, I'm responding right away. Try me, okay? Give me a chance to prove myself, right? So, um, it's a th- but this week only. <laughs> no, I'm gonna try. No, I'm gonna try to. I'm gonna try to improve, but. Again, there are things that we need to do right away. 
the things that we can, you know what, this, this I can do next week, I can do in two weeks. There are things that I'm just going to push them aside. I'll, I'll, re, I'll, I'll defer, I'll, I'll, I'll delay them a little bit. There's those that I can defer. And then there are others. And I would, I would say delegate is one of the D's also. There's some that you can have someone else do. You don't need to be doing that. Okay. And then there's delete. There are things that it's just, this is not, right? When you get, did you update your auto insurance? Uh, right. Okay. Your, right. Just not auto insurance. I'm talking your auto, uh, what is it called? Um, yeah. Um, I think everyone knows what I'm talking about. Your, um, extended warranty, your extended warranty, right? Yeah. So that you can delete. Um, okay. So we see that Reuben, the oldest of the tribes, was scolded by his father for being reckless, for being hasty, for being impetulant. He didn't think things through. That means there's a danger of doing things without thinking. Just do it. Right? And that, that's, that, that's the risk. That's the other side of doing things and not properly thinking through it. And I think it's very important that, yes, I'm, I'm on it, but let's, let me just give a second of thought to it. Make sure that I'm doing the right thing. Make sure that I'm heading in the right direction. So, <clears throat> you know, there's, there's a, um, So they say that Zrizin Makdimin Mitzvot, which is the tractate in Talmud, says um, in Sachim 4a, says the zealous advance themselves toward mitzvahs. The sages explain, there's a whole other explanation to this. It's not that they advance themselves towards mitzvahs, but rather mitzvahs are advanced to them. Opportunities come their way. Because they allow, they allow those opportunities to come. They open up the doorways, they open up the channels for more blessing to come their way. The more they rush towards a mitzvah, towards an opportunity to do good, the more opportunities will allow for do, uh, uh, we allow for ourselves uh, in, in, in for doing those mitzvahs. So there are there are um, there are sages who say the following that. When one begins to work on their character, when one begins to work on their character, on their trait, on midos, midos are traits. By the way, what's the, where does the word mida come from? Mida is a trait. Mida is a trait. And we mentioned this briefly last week, but just so we understand, mida means a measurement. It means a measurement. Every human being has different measurements of traits, right? Which one of us is a 10 out of 10 in alacrity where never procrastinate, never push anything off, right? Who's a 10 out of 10? Now, this is a positive trait, just so you know. It's a positive trait. Utilizing, if we talked about laziness, that's a different story. We're not talking about laziness now. We're talking about getting things done, becoming doers, becoming builders. That when people ask us, we're going to say yes. I'm going to, even if I can't do it, I'm going to help you find someone who can. Because that opportunity came my way. I'm not going to push it off. I'm going to find the opportunity. I'm going to find the way to make this a, um, to get this thing done. The, so the, the, the Mishnah says that Al Tomar Lekisha Efne Eshne Shema Lotipane. Tractate Avot. Ethics of our fathers. It says, don't say, when I have time, then I will. Because you may not ever have time. That opportunity of when I have time may never happen. It's something which is, which is for all of us, this is such a critical thing. How do we know if we'll ever have that opportunity again? Ask me next time. There may not be a next time. Okay? That doesn't mean, look, we have to be realistic as well. And we mentioned... We have to be careful. That doesn't mean that everything that every person wants from us, we're going to do. We're not necessarily capable of doing whatever everybody wants. 
we have to prioritize. And that's that's really the first step of this. When we grab our Musa worksheet at the end of class tonight, and we're going to start filling this out, okay, what, what do I want to accomplish here this week? I would say the first step is prioritizing. What are my priorities? If a person is struggling with anxiety, and they're dealing with too many things on that list, so maybe they need to start Deciding, what do I need to do? What can I defer? What can I delete? What can I delegate? What can I delay and prioritize like that? Are there things that I can do for other people? If if I take care of all the things I can, if someone has a responsibility for their own family, that comes first. One's children comes first, right? So we all have things that we are more passionate about And therefore, we're more enthusiastic about. And so too, we have things that we're less passionate about. And that makes us more lazy about those things, right? You have those things that, right? We have things, right? We we all have certain things, right? Try to bring a good example. Um, Okay, I'll give you an example. Anybody here like gardening? Anybody like gardening? You like gardening, right? Anybody else like gardening? Okay, I have a black thumb on every finger here. Okay, I I I kill plants. I don't know. I just I I don't know how. To, I don't know what I'm doing. I really don't. Right. So if my wife were to tell me, "Can you take care of the the garden or take care of the the?" the I was like, "That's like a sentence for me." Okay, I'm not motivated. I'm not excited by it. I'm not now. They're like you. You'd love that opportunity, right? But. If you were to ask me about a piece of technology, I love technology. I love technology. I love IoT, the Internet of Things. I love all the, right? I love it. I love, you know, everything is automated and all these systems. I love it. So which one, if you're challenged and you have two things that need to get done, one that you're motivated to do and one that you're not motivated to do, which should you do first? Exactly. The one you're not motivated to do. Because the one you're not motivated to do, if you don't do it first, you'll never do it. Right? We all have parts of our job that are more enjoyable and less enjoyable. Do the less enjoyable. Well, I, it really depends. It really depends what? Because the truth is that motivational uh, speakers will tell you, do the one you are excited because that gets the ball ro- rolling. It gets it, it gets it rolling. And then you'll end up doing the thing you're not motivated as well. But I'll, I'll give you a different example. My grandfather was a Musser master. Now in yeshiva, you study Musser study, but you also study Talmud. Now Talmud is deep, um, hypothetical dilemmas. Which are really discussing, you know, they're both, both of them are speaking, are learning God's way of thinking, God's way of living. So my grandfather was with a dilemma. He had the Musser study that he needed to write and review. And he had his Talmud study that he needed to write and review. Which should he do first? He only had a certain amount of time. So he decided that he was going to do his Talmud, which was less favored by him. He was going to do his Talmud. You know why? Because he was motivated already to write the Musr stuff. That he'll get done because he likes it. He enjoys it. He'll get it done. So he first did what he didn't like as much. You know, there was a, there was a story. Someone asked the rabbi, I only have 10 minutes a day to study Torah. What should I study? Should I study Musr? Should I study Halacha? Uh, Jewish law, should I study the Parsha? What should I study? So the rabbi said, study Musr. He says, Musr of everything? I should study Musr? He says, yeah. When you study Musr for 10 minutes a day, you'll see that you have much more than 10 minutes. <laughs> right? You'll see that you really have, your priorities need to be adjusted a little bit. Okay? But we see something really amazing. We see that Abraham didn't delay. It said about Abraham four, four, three different times. It says in uh, Genesis 19, it says, Vayashkem Abraham and, and Abraham rose up early in the morning. 
It says again, Vayashkem Avraham Baboki. He woke up early in the morning. Each one, this one was to, for the binding of Isaac. And this one was when, when, right? Vayashkem Avraham Baboki, Vayachem Moshe's Chamorro. Each time, he was, right away, he was on a mission. What do we know about Abraham? He's, he's the founder of monotheism, right? He brought the consciousness of God into this world. He had a lot of work to do. He was on a mission. I don't have time to sleep. It reminds me of my rabbi. My, my rabbi, me, he live and be well. My rabbi lives in Jerusalem. He was born in, in the Bronx. And uh, many times during his lecture, he would fall asleep. His head would, would, you know, and then he'd wake up. And it was an amazing thing. He'd wake up and continue with, in the middle of the word, he left off. So I once asked him, I said, I said, Rebbe, you're, you're a little bit tired, you know. Maybe you should sleep. He says, I'll sleep when I die. All right? And he told me he sleeps two and a half hours a night. He sleeps from 11 o'clock till 1.30 every, every night. That's it. That's it. He says he trained his body to need less. And sometimes, you know, the, he has a little short during the day, a short nap, a little, a little... <laughs> Right, but but the, he told me he says I, I don't have time to sleep. I don't have time to sleep. There's so much to do. I said, why do you wake up so so early? He says because it's the only time I can learn without interruption. He says all day I have classes. I have people calling. I have questions. He, he's a rabbi of a big community. He's a rabbi of a very big yeshiva. He has over 450 students who have graduated through his rabbinic rabbinical uh, training, who are all over the world. Right, and he's training new students every every year. He has another fifty, sixty students going through the system. It, it's an amazing, an amazing pro. Excuse me, an amazing program. And he's one of the leading rabbinic authorities in in, in Israel, living in Jerusalem. It, it's unbelievable. Where does he have time for everything? And when you ask him, I've asked him so many different questions. Sharp as a whip. It's it's amazing. He knows everything. So someone once said to him, he says, he said, it's not fear. I, if I was smart like you, I would also know everything. He says, that's not fear. He says, that's not fear. He says, I wake up every morning at 1.30 in the morning and spend five and a half hours reviewing so that I can remember. Because to him, knowledge of Torah is a priority. So he spends his time, right? To him, th- that's a priority. As soon as the, the, the crack of sun Right? He's praying, and then, boom, the marathon of the day is on, is on its way. I will tell you something very, very special, though. A friend of mine told me that he met him at a florist. He met my rabbi. He saw, not met him. He saw him at a florist on a Friday afternoon, and he was picking out each rose. He was picking out. He wanted a red one, and he wanted a pink one. And he was like picking him out, putting together the bouquet for his wife for Shabbos, right? And it, every single Friday, the this, this student said, you can see him at the flower shop and he picks out the, you know, the exact roses, each one, because that's also a priority for him. He may be away all day. He wants his wife to know how much he loves her. He wants to know how, 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 how he wants to express his passion Right now, that there are some people who don't like roses. All right, if you can believe that, right? But, but he knows what's important. He has his priorities. So he could say very. He can he can come home and say, "I'm sorry, you know, I'm a busy guy. I don't have time to buy roses." Or he can say, "This is a priority. This is something I need to get done." Vayashkem Avraham Baboker. Abraham woke up early in the morning. I, this this doesn't mean that you can't sleep in. This doesn't mean that if you know if you hit the snooze button that it's all you know it's all for right. No. The idea is that we have prayer. I'll give you another example of a mitzvah we don't wait for. The bris, a bris, a baby eight days old. When do we have the bris? In the morning. Why in the morning? Don't delay. Don't delay the mitzvah. We want. So we have many, 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 many more pages to go of of notes and. Uh, but we don't have time to continue forever. I want to take everyone's questions still. So, my dear friends, 
let's utilize this coming week. Please take a moment, print out that sheet if you don't have it, your meter worksheet. If you have a clear definition, which I hope you do after this hour and uh, five-minute class, um, on what this trade is, define it in your own words. Make it yours. This is yours. It's not what I said. It's what, what, what you feel. Make it yours. Introspect. Where are you holding with this? And what? And set out a plan of how you want to change by next week already. You'll feel, hopefully, if each day you journal, and you can go on the email that was sent out earlier tonight. You can send out this link, and you can print it out. You can download those pages. There's a folder. I shared all the documents in there. Um, journal. Journal your journey. Your journey. Every day, mark the notes, mark it down, and hopefully you'll start feeling that transformation in your own life every single day. So um, if the, if anyone has any questions, you're welcome to, welcome to unmute yourselves and to uh, ask anything. But I want to thank everyone for coming here tonight at the Torch Center. Thank you, everyone online. And if you have any questions, you're welcome to email me because I will respond. And... Uh, uh, and if you have any questions, you're welcome to unmute your microphones. Yes. Um, I want to go back to the um, when you give to a poor person, you'll never lose out because you're actually giving to the Almighty. Right. And I know, like in the air, we have people that come door to door. Sometimes it, right. we we always have something for them, but like to include like every single pan landlord in Houston. Yeah. Or, it's a it's a very good question. All right, so uh, what's about the panhandlers? Is that also God? So I, I think so. And what I like to do for that, I don't think it's a good idea to give them money, personally, yeah. because I think it's poor decisions with money that got them there. It's probably not a good idea to give them money to keep them there. Um, so what I t like to do is I like to have like these nut bars or, or things that are nutritious in my car, and I'll give them that. Um, because I want them to be able to eat, and I want I want to provide f something for them. I don't want to just pass the, by the opportunity to be giving to someone. So when I see the the panhandlers, I I I do typically roll down my window and say, here, you know, why don't you eat a granola bar? Why don't you eat something? Here's something nutritious. So give them a bottle of water, um, because I want to help them. I want to be I want to be a giver. But on the other hand, we have to be, particularly with people who make bad decisions, we can't be enablers that will, you know, enable them to uh, to, to continue to make bad decisions. Okay. okay? That's a good question. Like the people that come around that Are, have papers. And right. And, e and even then, even then you want to make sure that you prioritize, right? Yeah. We have local institutions. We have our own schools and our own schools and our own, right? So that there's, you know, the Rambam, Maimonides has the laws of, of priorities, but the idea is always to remember to be the giver, and that we should always be blessed to be the givers on the giving side, and that, that that's that's really what we want to be is we want to take that opportunity and take that privilege to be the giver and be godlike in the way we give. Great question. Anyone online? Anybody online? You can unmute, and uh, are you able to unmute? Are you able to unmute? Anybody have any questions? Anna, you always have a great question. Sorry, Rabbi Wolby, I'm off my name today. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to see you. It's great to see you. Okay, no questions. Okay, okay, everybody, let's get to work. We got a full weekend. Oh, you got a question. Okay, so here, here, let me, okay, so, you know, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Thank you, thank you. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll spend time. Hi, we'll, I have a question. Okay. Sure. Who's speaking? Hi, my name is Rebecca, Rebecca Suisa. Hi, Rebecca. <laughs> Joining from Maryland. Hello, Rebecca. <laughs> Hello. How's the weather up there? Cold. Um, <laughs> Very cold. I'm sorry. I'm no, so it's fine. Right. It's the seasonality is nice. Right. I will tell you. I will tell you that we also have like frigid weather. It's like 60 degrees here in Houston, and it's like everyone's pulling out their boots and they're yeah. <laughs> I, I recently moved from Los Angeles, so I'm, I'm familiar with that kind of cold. Right. Right. <laughs> 
But um, you, we were talking about the, the, the things that we're motivated to do and what we're not motivated to do, right? Right. So when you're ranking or rating yourself on a scale of one to ten, what do you, what are you ra- rating? Exactly. Would you take like the weighted average of like the things you like to do and you don't like to do? Like, what, how do you really assess? Because in some areas, like if I want to do it, I'm like, it's, then you're, you know, then, then, my minor need for improvement. But if it's something that you don't want to do or something that's not close to you, like even with like Ches said, you know, if it's a cause that is very close to your heart, you're so willing to give. You'll you'll do anything for that cause. But if it's a cause that is not so close to your heart, you're like a little less motivated. So how do you really rate yourself? Because isn't it coming from a place of like self-service or selfishness? Like how do you really rate yourself? That's an excellent, excellent question. So I, 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 I haven't thought of that. But let me give you what I typically do when I have such a challenge, okay, is that I think of what is the idea of this trait? This idea is to emulate God. And God is perfect in all his traits. So if in, in trying to think of how I can best emulate God, I, I, I will evaluate in my introspection, where am I with this trait with everything? So take everything that comes our way. Now, that doesn't mean that every cause that comes your way you have to become passionate about. Definitely not. Right? Especially, I mean, today you have you know, the save the whales and you have, a, you know, you have every type of uh, passion is out there. You can find that you can find something for everyone. But, but the things that are within your realm with things that are within your, you know, within your world, uh, how are you dealing with those? And I think that that's really where, where we need to, you know, take take the general things that are in your day and evaluate them. Um, and, you know, slowly expand that out. Is that how about things that are irregular, things that are not part of my daily schedule and evaluate those. So you can make, you know, things that I'm passionate about. I'm a 10 out of 10. Great. That's phenomenal. Keep that. Keep that strong. Now, how can I add other things that are out of my comfort zone and bring them into the fold and make them as well part of the 10 out of 10? Okay. Thank you. Rebecca, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Terrific. Thank Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. All right, no questions here? Nobody else? Hello, Robert. You got a good question there? All right, everyone. Have a terrific evening. Thank you so much for joining. I look forward to seeing you next week. Well, I will tell you the name of your, your grandfather. You said that he wrote a book. Recording last week. stopped. Um, yeah, who is that? Lauren? Yes. Okay, so uh, yeah, he wrote a book named Ale Shur. Right over here. This is the book. Um, Ale Shore. It's only in Hebrew. It's in the process of being translated. Uh, not out yet. It's gonna take. It's gonna take a lot of time and a lot of money to translate this. Um, but it's. It's. This is. This is a master, master, masterpiece of of incredible brilliance. I guess uh, I have to just listen to his sons. His, his grandsons. But yes, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what. I wish I would have one percent of his brilliance uh he's he was just an unbelievable man who who lived this he didn't write it as a, a you know you know many people write books they do they take a six-month break they do research and then they and then they write their book this was my grandfather's life he didn't this is like his i would say that this is his autobiography this is who he was and by the way he has many chapters talking about this very topic of his that we discussed today of alacrity uh, he actually discusses this in the book, and some of what we discussed tonight is a is a uh, is a uh, I say a small little you know summary of what he says. You've been listening to the Jewish Inspiration Podcast, a Torch production. Become a supporter at torchweb.org because your assistance enables more Torah learning around the globe. To find more lessons offered by Torch, please visit torchpodcast.com